Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson. Read by Adrian Pretzelis. Santa Rosa, California, October 2007. To the Hesitating Purchaser If sailor tales to sailor tunes Storm and adventure, heat and cold If schooners, islands and maroons And buccaneers and buried gold And all the old romance retold Exactly in the ancient way Can please as me they pleased of old The wiser youngsters of today So be it, and fall on If not... If studious youth no longer crave His ancient appetites forgot Kingston or Ballantine the brave Or Cooper of the wood and wave So be it also And may I and all my pirates share the grave Where these and their creations lie To Lloyd Osborne An American gentleman in accordance with whose classic taste The following narrative has been designed it is now, in return for numerous delightful hours, and with the kindest wishes, dedicated by his affectionate friend, the author. Part 1. The Old Buccaneer. Chapter 1. At the Admiral Benbow. Squire Trelawney, Dr. Livesey, and the rest of these gentlemen, having asked me to write down the whole particulars about Treasure Island, from the beginning to the end, keeping nothing back but the bearings of the island, and that only because there is still treasure not yet lifted, I take up my pen in the year of grace, seventeen, and go back to the time when my father kept the Admiral Benbow Inn, and the brown old seaman with the sabre cut first took up his lodging under our roof. I remember him as if it were yesterday. As he came plodding to the inn door, his sea chest following behind him in a hand barrow. A tall, strong, heavy, nut brown man, his tarry pigtail falling over the shoulders of his soiled blue coat, his hands ragged and scarred with dirty, broken nails, and the sabre cut across one cheek, a dirty, livid white. I remember him looking round the cove and whistling to himself as he did so, and then breaking out in that old sea song that he sang so often afterwards. Fifty men on a dead man's chest, yo-ho-ho ho, and a bottle of rum. In the high old tottering voice that seemed to have been tuned and broken at the capstan bars. Then he rapped on the door with a bit of a stick, like a hand spike that he carried, and when my father appeared, called roughly for a glass of rum. This, when it was brought to him, he drank slowly, like a connoisseur, lingering on the taste, and still looking about him at the cliffs, and up at our signboard. This is a handy cove, says he at length, and a pleasant situated grog shop. Much company, mate? My father told him, no, very little company, the more was the pity. Well then, says he, this is the berth for me. Here you, matey, he cried to the man who trundled the barrow. Bring up alongside and help up my chest. I'll stay here a bit, he continued. I'm a plain man. Rum and bacon and eggs is what I want. And that head up there to watch ships off. What you mun call me? You mun call me Captain. Oh, I see what you're at. There. And he threw down three or four gold pieces on the threshold. You can tell me when I've worked through that, said he, looking as fierce as a commander. And indeed, bad as his clothes were, and coarsely as he spoke, he had none of the appearance of a man who sailed before the mast, but seemed like a mate or a skipper accustomed to be obeyed or to strike. The man who came with the barrow told us the mail had set him down the morning before at the Royal George, that he had inquired what inns were along the coast, and hearing ours well spoken of, I suppose, 
and described as lonely, had chosen it from the others for his place of residence. And that was all we could learn of our guest. He was a very silent man by custom. All day he hung round the cove or upon the cliffs with a brass telescope. All evening he sat in the corner of the parlour next the fire and drank rum and water, very strong. Mostly he would not speak when spoken to, only look up sudden and fierce and blow through his nose like a foghorn. And we and the people who came about our house soon learned to let him be. Every day when he came back from his stroll, he would ask if any seafaring men had gone by along the road. At first we thought it was the want of company of his own kind that made him ask this question, but at last we began to see he was desirous to avoid them. When a seaman put up the Admiral Benbow, and now and then some did, making by the coast road for Bristol, he would look in at him through the curtained door before he entered the parlour, and he was always sure to be as silent as a mouse when any such was present. For me, at least, there was no secret about the matter, for I was, in a way, a sharer in his alarms. He had taken me aside one day and promised me a silver fourpenny on the first of every month if I would only keep my weather eye open for a seafaring man with one leg and let him know the moment he appeared. Often enough, when the first of the month came round and I applied to him for my wage, he would only blow through his nose at me and stare me down. But before the week was out, he was sure to think better of it bring me my fourpenny piece, and repeat his orders to look out for the seafaring man with one leg. How that personage haunted my dreams, I need scarcely tell you. On stormy nights, when the wind shook the four corners of the house, and the surf roared along the cove and up the cliffs, I would see him in a thousand forms, and with a thousand diabolical expressions. Now the leg would be cut off at the knee, now at the hip. Now he was a monstrous kind of a creature who never had but one leg and that in the middle of his body. To see him leap and run and pursue me over the hedge and ditch was the worst of nightmares. And altogether I paid pretty dear for my monthly fourpenny piece in the shape of these abominable fantasies. But though I was so terrified by the idea of the seafaring man with one leg, I was far less afraid of the captain himself than anybody else who knew him. There were nights when he took a great deal more rum and water than his head would carry, and then he would sometimes sit and sing his wicked old wild sea songs, minding nobody. But sometimes he would call for glasses round and force all the trembling company to listen to his stories or bear a chorus to his singing. Often I have heard the house shaking with yo-ho-ho -ho and a bottle of rum, all the neighbours joining in for dear life with the fear of death upon them and each singing louder than the other to avoid remark. For in these fits he was the most overriding companion ever known. He would slap his hand on the table for silence all around. He would fly up in a passion of anger at a question, or sometimes because none was put, and so he judged the company was not following his story. Nor would he allow anyone to leave the inn till he had drunk himself sleepy and reeled off to bed. His stories were what frightened people worst of all. Dreadful stories they were about hanging and walking the plank and storms at sea, and the dry tortugas, and wild deeds and places on the Spanish main. By his own account, he must have lived his life among some of the wickedest men that God ever allowed upon the sea. And the language in which he told these stories shocked our plain country people almost as much as the crimes that he described. My father was always saying the inn would be ruined, for people would soon cease coming there to be tyrannized over and put down, and sent shivering to their beds. But I really believe his presence did us good. People were frightened at the time, but on looking back they rather liked it. It was a fine excitement in a quiet country life, and there was even a party of the younger men who pretended to admire him, 
calling him a true sea dog and a real old salt and such like names and saying there was the sort of man that made England terrible at sea. In one way, indeed, he bade fare to ruin us, for he kept on staying week after week, and at last month after month, so that all the money had been long exhausted, and still my father never plucked up the heart to insist on having more. If ever he mentioned it, the captain blew through his nose so loudly that you might say that he roared, and stared my poor father out of the room. I have seen him wringing his hands after such a rebuff, and I am sure the annoyance and the terror he lived in must have greatly hastened his early and unhappy death. All the time he lived with us, the captain made no change whatever in his dress but to buy some stockings from a hawker. One of the cocks of his hat having fallen down, he let it hang from that day forth, though it was a great annoyance when it blew. I remember the appearance of his coat, which he patched himself upstairs in his room, and which, before the end, was nothing but patches. He never wrote or received a letter, and he never spoke with any but the neighbours, and with these, for the most part, only when drunk on rum. The great sea chest none of us had ever seen open. He was only once crossed, and that was toward the end, when my father was far gone in a decline that took him off. Dr. Livesey came late one afternoon to see the patient, took a bit of dinner from my mother, and went into the parlour to smoke a pipe until his horse should come down from the hamlet, for we had no stabling at the old Benbow. I followed him in, and I remember observing the contrast, the neat, bright doctor with his powder as white as snow, and his bright black eyes and pleasant manners, made with the cultish country folk, and above all that filthy, heavy, bleared scarecrow of a pirate of ours, sitting far gone in rum, with his arms on the table. Suddenly he, the captain that is, began to pipe his eternal song. Fifteen men on a dead man's chest, yo-ho-ho, ho, and a bottle of rum, drink and the devil have done for the rest. Yo, ho, ho, and a bottle of rum. At first I had supposed the dead man's chest to be that identical big box of his upstairs in the front room, and the thought had been mingled in my nightmares with that of the one-legged seafaring man. But by this time we had all long ceased to pay any particular notice to the song. It was new that night to nobody but Dr. Livesey and on him, I observe, it did not produce an agreeable effect, for he looked up for a moment quite angrily before he went on with his talk to old Taylor, the gardener, on a new cure for rheumatics. In the meantime, the captain gradually brightened up at his own music, and at last flapped his hand upon the table before him in a way we all knew to mean silence. The voices stopped at once, all but Dr. Livesey's. He went on as before, speaking clear and kind, and drawing briskly at his pipe between every word or two. The captain glared at him for a while, flapped his hand again, glared still harder, and at last broke out with the villainous oath. Silence there between decks.